I now call the Shadow Secretary of State, Ian Murray. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker, and a very happy St Patrick's Day yeah. Yeah. to you and everyone in the House. Uh, I'm sure, Mr Speaker, you'll be as astonished as I was to hear that the SNP was using one of their irregular Opposition Day debates to talk about independence. <laughs> Indeed, even the member for Edinburgh East said this was a very rare debate for the SNP to have. You could, Mr Speaker, have knocked me over with a feather, and that's no mean task with my extra 10 lockdown kilos. <laughs> it's not as if there isn't anything for us to debate today. You wouldn't think we were in the worst health and economic crisis since World War II. And why do the SNP want to turn the Scottish election in May into a referendum on whether or not we have another referendum? Because they can't defend their atrocious record in government yeah. for the last 14 years. They have no defence at all and nothing to offer. 25 minutes of opening speech and not one positive policy about how to deal with the problems in Scotland. And the sheer arrogance of the SNP to make assumptions about the election result without a single cross being put in a single ballot box anywhere in Scotland. And you heard it today. You no longer hear the cry of 22 polls in a row in favour of separation, when it is now four in a row in favour of staying part of the United Kingdom. The one today being 57 per cent to 43. They are being found out. We could have been debating all sorts of major issues today, Mr Speaker. We could have debated our democratic institutions in Scotland and if the Scottish Government legislative settlement needs to be improved to allow MSPs to properly hold the Scottish Government to account. The Minister made those points uh, yesterday. I I'm happy to give way. Uh, the poll today shows that only 46 per cent of, of the uh, Scottish electorate support independence, which a few months ago was 58 per cent, so it's down 12 per cent. I look at my, my brothers and sisters, my Gallic friends here around me, but I do say this very gently to them. The poll that really matters is the last one. And does the honourable gentleman feel that the reason why that, why that has happened is in part is due to the fact of the COVID uh, and the coronavirus vaccine uh, rollout? It's, to everyone that has been expressed across the whole of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland that together we are better. Does he agree? Yeah. Yeah. Mr. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, I'm sorry to have not heard my uh, honourable friend. I, 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 the, the, the intervention king I, I didn't quite hear, so I do apologise. But he's right, and the reason that I think the polls have moved is because the SNP have arrogantly assumed that the Scottish people want independence. So people have started to ask the big questions, of which there have been no answers uh, forthcoming. And people realise with the vaccine rollout, with the COVID support, that we are much better and much stronger as a nation, working with our partners and friends as part of the family of four nations of the UK. But Mr. I'll give way. I thank the honourable member for giving way. Uh, the member from Edinburgh said that uh, on page one of their manifesto will be the independence referendum. He said that on page one of our manifesto will be uh, no independence referendum. What's Labour's position on a referendum and what page will it be in their manifesto? <laughs> Uh, well, it won't be in our manifesto because our manifesto would be a national recovery plan yeah. for the nation in terms of COVID recovery. We're not here to debate to the party referendums of what manifestos might be. Otherwise, we will be here a long time. And which election do we start with, Ian Murray? Thank you very much, uh, Mr Speaker. Let me go back to what we could be uh, debating today. We, uh, and just for, for the record, uh, the members, the member for Edinburgh East and the member for Edinburgh South, he doesn't represent the whole city, despite the fact that they think they represent the whole of Scotland. We could have debated, Mr Speaker, that picture that everyone will have seen on social media, that dreadful picture from George Square in Glasgow last month, where 220 people were queuing up in sub-zero temperatures in the snow to get food from the soup kitchen. Yeah. A photo says a thousand words, and those words were saying that both the UK and Scottish Government are failing the people of Scotland yeah. that need their governments the most. Yeah. But no, we're not debating that. We could have debated universal credit and the £20 uplift becoming permanent, extending it to legacy benefits, removing the, late, the rate clause and helping those most in need. But no. I'll, I'll come back in a second. We could have debated the First Minister's so-called top priority, education. But the SNP can't defend the widening educational attainment gap, yeah, yeah. thousands of fewer teachers, a lower spend per pupil than in 2007, Scotland plummeting down the international rankings, or Scotland's education system being behind England for the first time ever. Yeah. Behind Tory England for the first time ever. They won't even publish the OECD report into Scottish education before the election, and I wonder why. We could have debated education and our children's future, but no. We could have debated why, even before COVID, the SNP Scottish Government hadn't met their own legal NHS waiting times targets since 2012. They've broken their own law 360,000 times in the process. 
But no. How about international issues? We could have debated the atrocities in the coup in Myanmar, the worst humanitarian disaster the world has ever seen in Yemen, or Scotland's wonderful partnership with Malawi. But no. We could have debated how Scottish businesses recover from COVID and how we can support those sectors in hospitality, tourism and culture that will take the longest to recover and have been hardest hit. What about the three million excluded from any government support? We could have debated that, but no. We could have debated how the Scottish taxpayers are on the hook for over half a billion pounds to fund a 25-year guarantee for a failing business that owns an aluminium smelter and a hydropower plant in Scotland, but no. We could have debated the Audit Scotland report last month that says there are billions of pounds of COVID support funds unspent by the Scottish Government and audited what they're spending them on. But no. We could have been having a debate about COP26 and climate change. But no. We could have celebrated the success of the vaccine rollout, all nations of the UK working together with our wonderful science and research and development. But no. We could have even debated how the Tories are, being the, are a bigger threat to the Union than any nationalists. Yeah. They got it into this mess by playing fast and loose with the UK Constitution in the first place, bringing us Brexit, English votes for English laws, cronyism, wasting £37 billion on test and trace, and how they have nothing to offer Scotland but waving their own flag. But no, we could even have debated how to eradicate child poverty, Madam Deputy Speaker, but no. The SNP used their precious parliamentary time to debate another referendum. Quell surprise. And surely if the SNP want to turn the election in May into a referendum on having another referendum, then they could at least put their cards on the table and be straight with the Scottish people. Even the Honourable Gentleman for Edinburgh East in his introduction said on several occasions during his speech, let's be honest with each other. So let's today make this a great opportunity for them to use their speeches to tell us what their separation proposition means. Yeah. Let's be honest with each other. On EU accession, how, when, why, how you meet the criteria. On borders, will it be determined by the trade and cooperation agreement that has just been signed between the UK and the EU because the Health Secretary said on question time two weeks ago that it wouldn't. Happy to give way. I, I thank the uh, Honourable Gentleman for giving way. All of these questions will be discussed and decided upon if and when we get to a referendum campaign and a referendum vote. What is at stake on May the 6th is who should make the decision on whether that process happens, whether people in Scotland have the right to even choose to make that consideration. That is a different matter. What is your view on that? Yeah, yeah. When I pose the challenge to the honourable gentleman, let's be honest with each other, the answer comes no. What is at stake at the elections on the 6th of May? is how Scotland recovers from the worst health and economic crisis since the Second World War, and to plunge the country into another divisive independence referendum debate while people are more worried about their lives, their livelihoods and the health of their friends and their family is absolutely deplorable. On oil price, I have to give way to my honourable friend and I'll come back to you. I am very grateful to him for, for giving way and uh, he's making a characteristically excellent speech. Um, can I just say um, that what he's saying about uh, the timing of the referendum is something that polling is clear about. Whilst the polling's moved up and down on the subject of whether there should, uh, whether there should be independence, polling is absolutely clear that even the majority of those who are in favour of independence don't think that we should have a referendum right now. So what are those people supposed to do when they know, when they go and vote in May, if they vote for the Scottish National Party, they'll be seen as having endorsed a referendum that they themselves don't think should happen right now. <laughs> My honourable friend hits the nail on the head because the priorities of the Scottish people are health, education, COVID recovery, the economy, jobs and livelihoods. That is what's important to the Scottish people and poll after poll after poll it shows that. Let's be honest with each other, Madam Deputy Speaker, on the oil price. $114 a barrel was underpinning the entire Scottish economy. It's been less than half of that since the last referendum. On deficits and debt, how would they be dealt with? On pensions, there are SNP candidates in constituencies up and down Scotland delivering leaflets promising pensioners they will double the state pension. Let's be honest with each other. And how would they work with the rest of the UK with regards to the EU? I'll come back because I said I would. You know. Well, for a start, if we're going to be honest, it's quite clear we don't have people out delivering leaflets right now due to the COVID restrictions. But if we're talking about honesty, will I answer the question? If the voters vote for parties that have got a referendum in their manifesto, should that referendum happen to reflect the will of the Scottish people? 
gives an honest answer. I, I would be, I'll be honest with the honourable gentleman. The leaf that was delivered in Dumbarton and was posted on social media by the person who delivered it. So that is, let's be honest uh, with each other. And let me just say to the honourable gentleman, I am very much in the same place as Sir John Curtis. You can't extrapolate a single issue from a general election, and I think it's disingenuous to suggest that we should turn this major election, the most important, I think, in Scotland's devolution history, into whether or not we should have a referendum on another referendum. And let me, Madam Deputy Speaker, let, let, me, let me make a little bit of progress, if I may. Uh, let me go to the biggest issue of all, currency. We have had the same old arguments from the SNP time and time again. So part, perhaps they can perhaps tell us something new. Let's be honest with each other. What on earth would the people be voting for? Take this issue of currency. And let me say, if any of the SNP members want to intervene me and tell me what the answer is, I'll give them the floor for as long as they like. Because the member for Ross Sky and Lacaba, the leader of the SNP in this House, promotes sterilisation. He says people shouldn't worry, we'll be keep using the pound until such times as six tests are met, however long that would be. The member for the Western Isles tells us we'll only keep the pound for a few months. The SNP's deputy leader, Keith Brown, says we'll keep the pound for less than five years. The head of the SNP's Growth Commission, a former SNP finance minister, Andrew Wilson, says it could be a decade before we give up the pound. Does any SNP member want to tell us exactly how long we'll keep the pound? Is it a few months? Is it five years? Is it ten years? Is it indefinitely? Will we keep it at all? Let's just be honest with each other if you want to turn this debate into a referendum on whether or not we have a referendum. Happy to give way. The Honourable Gentleman for giving way, and he's making an excellent case on the lack of clarity from the Scottish National Party. Uh, but what he needs to be clear on to the Scottish people when he goes to the polls on May the 6th is whether his party backs a referendum or not. We've been honest, they've been honest about what they want. Will he now be honest and say what his position is? Yeah. The question is no. The, and on to interest rates, Madam Deputy Speaker. And just, you know, the, the, the Conservatives do this all the time, Madam Deputy Speaker. They deliberately misinterpret the Scottish Labour Party's policy in order to feather their own electoral nest. That is why they're putting the union at risk and why they're a bigger threat to the UK than any nationalists. Let me turn to the interest rate question, Madam Deputy Speaker. And for as long as we don't have our own currency, the member for Glasgow East, who's in the chamber, somehow thinks we will still have monetary and interest rate policy. But his own SNP Minister for Energy, Paul White, Wheelhouse MSP, says without a central bank or lender of last resort, we'd have to take whatever interest rates were set. Can any SNP member intervene and tell us who's right, the member for Glasgow East or the Scottish Government Minister? That leads us to exchange rates. Let's try another one. The member for Ross Sky and Lacarber says, when we do have our own currency, it has to be pegged against the pound sterling. But the member for Edinburgh South West suggests that won't be the case because we'd need to meet the exchange rate mechanism to enter the EU. Again, what is it? Is it we would have to take our own exchange rate mechanism to qualify for the EU or will we peg it to sterling? And maybe the answer is none. Could it be the euro, as the member for Stirling said? Maybe Bitcoin, as the former SNP member for East Lothian said? Or worse yet, our flexible friend? <laughs> Will we all use our credit cards as if we were on holiday? As the SNP MSP Emma Harper suggested in a TV debate, she said we don't need a currency at all because we all use plastic anyway. <laughs> The position of SNP parliamentarians on these matters would be hilarious were it not so serious about taking us out of the UK regardless of the economic and social chaos that this would cause. This is about people's jobs, mortgages, livelihoods. It's about our communities. So if the SNP insist on focusing on separation instead of how we get people back to work, lift families and children out of poverty, how we restart and properly value our NHS and how we lead a national effort to recover from this pandemic, they should at least be straight with the Scottish people on how separation will affect their jobs, their livelihoods, their health, their education and their opportunities for the future. They refuse to put forward the details of se the separation proposition because the answers to these big questions are, are either unpalatable to the public or they actually don't know the answers. And let me just, let me just Karen, if you don't mind, because I have, I've taken longer than I had expected to do so. And let's just go back to the question that was debated earlier. When would that referendum be? The member for Henry said, he said, and let's check Hansard, no one is saying it would be this year. No one except for the First Minister when she set out an 11 point plan to potentially deliver even an illegal referendum this year. I will, but I've finished this point. The SNP Constitutional Minister and the President of the SNP, Mike Russell, said before Christmas. The SNP leader in this place, the member for Sky and Lochaba, said just a few weeks ago it could happen this year. Does anyone honestly believe, whether you are yes or no, that it would be in Scotland's interest to have a referendum on separation instead of a laser light focus on COVID recovery? Yeah. But that is their only priority. And if it wasn't their priority, they wouldn't put it on the ballot paper. 
If it wasn't their priority, they wouldn't be using the valuable four days until the Scottish Parliament goes into recess for the election to bring another referendum bill. The, the First Minister says she wants to be judged on her COVID record. So which one is it? So while most Scots are worried about their jobs and livelihoods, their health and that of their family and friends, the future for their children's education, how the NHS will catch up with cancer and other treatments that would be paused during COVID, they go on about the Constitution. And we can't rely on the UK Government to deliver a recovery that works for everyone. We've seen that already. They just want business as usual, looking after their neighbours and friends rather than the country. They want to defend a broken status quo rather than trying to fix it for yeah, the future. Yeah. And that's why the Scottish election must be about what the new Scottish Labour leader, Anna Sauer, is proposing. Delivering a national recovery plan yeah, yeah. that at its heart is about creating jobs, catching up on education and rebuilding our NHS so we never again have to choose between treating a virus or treating cancer. Yeah, yeah. That is what we'll be putting forward. A jobs and economic recovery plan, an NHS recovery plan, an education recovery plan, a climate recovery plan, a communities recovery plan. These are the priorities of the Scottish pe people by far and above all else. So, Madam Deputy Speaker, I'm happy to give way because I mentioned you in the speech. I'm very grateful to the Honourable Gentleman for giving way. And I sit from the back benches and I watch him as the lonely Scottish Labour MP at Westminster. And I do find myself just rather reflecting every now and again that his party, this once great party, when I was started campaigning in a Labour seat in 2001, it took 65% of the vote. Has he ever reflected? and why he is his party's sole representative at Westminster based on this intransigent policy against independence and against Scotland having the right to choose. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's called having principles. You ought to try it sometime. We're yeah. against independence yeah. because it would be bad for the Scottish people. And that's why you have to answer these questions. You can't just decide that you're going to move your principles and, and, and damage the Scottish economy, damage Scottish society, damage Scottish culture on the basis of what the honourable gentleman has just it said. And as Sauer will get the Scottish Labour yeah. back on track with his optimism and his positivity. And as we come out of this pandemic, my dear Mr. let me conclude. We must focus on solutions which ensure that Scotland comes back better, stronger, a fairer nation than the one that went into lockdown last year. The SNP want to go back to the same old divisive discussions while Labour and Scotland are looking to the future, not separation and not defending the broken status quo. It's just a few short weeks and as Sauer, has, uh, together with Keir Starmer, has shown we can be a credible alternative. Scots do not have to choose between the divisive politics of the SNP, uh, the divisive, arrogant politics of the SNP that I'm hearing behind me, or the Scottish Tories' status quo. Not one vote has been cast yet. Now more than ever, Scotland needs its powerful Parliament to deliver a strong NHS, take action on the jobs crisis, deliver a national care service, and treat poverty as the health and economic emergency that it is. And Scotland needs a government that doesn't just say education is a priority, but one that really shows our children and young people that we are committed to giving them the future that they deserve. Thank you. Yeah.